Lomax, and I will be your moderator for this next discussion, Women in Tech UK, Intersectionality, What Does It Mean? So before we jump in and have this wonderful conversation with all of our panelists, I think it would be very, very fitting if they would all introduce themselves. I could absolutely introduce them to you, but there's just something about hearing how someone chooses to introduce themselves. So we'll go around and we'll start with Rafi, and then Rafi, you can call the next person's name. And just can you very quickly introduce yourself to the audience, let them know where you are physically right now. I know we're in this virtual space, but where are you? And then what's your background? Awesome. Uh, thanks, Sable. So my name is Rafi Aladina. I am a diversity and inclusion consultant with a London-based consultancy named Frost Included. Uh, I'm originally from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and a diehard Edmonton Oilers hockey fan as a result. Uh, but I currently am based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, here in the United States. Um, my background is a little bit complex, and I'm sure we'll get into that a lot more. But I think some of the more salient things um, that kind of might come out in the discussion is that while I'm a diversity inclusion consultant now, and that means a lot of different types of work, uh, my background is actually originally in academia. So I studied implicit gender and racial bias in negotiations uh, mm. back in the day before I joined this company. Mm -hmm. And uh, my background is particularly in behavioral economics and statistics around diversity and inclusion topics. I love that. I love that. Uh, so maybe I'll pass it over to Elham. Thank you so much, Rafi. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is um, Elham Fardod. I am based in London, and um, in terms of my background, I have uh, spent 23 years as a finance and transformation director in GE, News Corp, and Ernest & Young. Mm. So very much a 23 years um, leadership background in the corporates. And the twist came really two years ago when the Parker Review was published in the UK. Mm -hmm. The Parker Review looked at the ethnic diversity of UK boardrooms. Mm -hmm. And I see nods around the panel. Uh, the numbers uh, looked a lot worse than I expected. And knowing uh, what we know about the root causes of lack of ethnic diversity in the UK boardrooms and indeed globally, I felt that I should use my uh, background in industry uh, to do something uh, in my own way about it. So I launched a charity and two years ago registered it with the Charity Commission in the UK and it, the charity is called Migrant Leaders. And two years on, we now have almost 400 director level mentors from 95 FTSE 100 and Fortune 500 and leading companies. Or so almost 400 senior directors um, mentoring um, 320 uh, young mentees, first and second generation migrants, as well as disadvantaged young people uh, between the age of 16 and 21. Uh, we also have corporate partnerships with Smith & Nephew, Cantor, Anglo-American, um, and through those partnerships, we've been able to deliver some uh, amazing work experiences. Um, and uh, more recently, I co-founded an organization, a business with purpose, um, uh, with my co-founder, Eric Furman, um, and this uh, business with uh, purpose is called ID Inclusion. So um, I see that Paulette Watson has just joined and I shall um, pass on to her to introduce herself. Hello, my name is Paulette Watson. I'm the um, founder and managing director for Academy Achievers. Um, we work with children and young people who are disadvantaged, disaffected and vulnerable, ages five to 19 years old, and they come from hard to reach communities. We specialize in science, technology, engineering and math. And recently, we've just hosted our first ever robotic automated competition um, oh, of our schools in the UK, totaling over 140 children and young people. And what they did, they got involved in using a robot called Mindstorm, where they had to understand how to build, create, and program the robot to solve missions. The good thing about the project that they did, we worked in um, collaboration with First Lego League, and what the children did, they were able to um, work in a group. So they, worked, they were competing as teams and they had to learn the value of um, core values, 
being respectful, being tolerant, and just, you know, just understanding people's differences. So um, it was good because a lot of them never ever seen a, a robot, never touched one. And um, we gave away 15 robots to each school. So it was good. We trained the teachers. And as a result of that, we were able to um, lead on different projects and partnerships with other organizations, especially grassroots communities, and even working with the, the schools at the within the different boroughs. So that's me. Oh, my parents are Jamaican heritage. So I've um, been over to Jamaica, done some projects there, but I'm back in the UK. So that's me. Awesome. And then Candice, last but not. Yes, Ken, uh, my name is Candice Costa. I am the UK ambassador of Women in Tech. I am. I have an agency for uh, digital marketing and social media for B2B. We specialize in B2B sphere. And uh, I also have been an advocate for the past five years and very strongly in the past three for technology in general as Tech London Advocate. And uh, uh, two years now as a woman in tech, and I found a magazine two and a half years ago, where is the first magazine that is focused hundred percent in women in technology. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. And I know I shared my name, but I didn't give anyone anything beyond that. So once again, I am Sable Lomax. I am the U.S. Director of Programs for Fearless Futures. Our headquarters is in London. I, however, am in the New York City, New Jersey area. I run the programs that take place in the States. We basically do equity and inclusion programs and consultancies for organizations, specifically focusing on senior leaders who are dedicated to figuring out the root causes of systemic inequities and what they can do to disrupt to cause transformative change within their organizations, for their people, and for their products. So with that mouthful out of the way, I am super excited for this panel. You've already, I'm, if, you, if I were you, I'd say, oh, I'm in for a treat just by listening to everyone's introduction. So I am excited and we're going to jump right in. Paulette, I'm going to start off with you. I would love for you to share with us, like, when did you first come to understand the term intersectionality? What's your story when it comes to intersectionality and what does it mean to you? Okay, so when I first come to understand intersectionality, I literally was living in Switzerland, Switzerland at the time. And mm -hmm. I had to do, um, I was asked to be a co-author to a book called School Leadership in the Caribbean, Perception, Practices, Paradigm. And my chapter was on every click matters, leadership, fellowship in ICT education in Jamaica. And when I was interviewing the black ladies who were um, who were tech leaders, well, they were leading in ICT in, in education, but when I started to talk to them and they were told, telling me about the barriers that they had um, experienced, meaning they were, it was difficult for them to get the top jobs, to become a head teacher, mm -hmm. their experience. And I was like, oh my goodness, like, wow, you know, every time I spoke to a different her, um, young woman, she had experienced a different, a different experience. And as I was doing my research to write for this chapter, I was um, thinking about, okay, so these women are experiencing all these issues when it comes to race and it comes to gender. And I came across the um, lady, Kimberly Crenshaw. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, oh my goodness, it's not just these women that are experiencing. I started to do some more depth, in depth in, in research on, and I realized that a lot of American women were being oppressed and the systems and the structures that were there that were blocking them from getting, from getting like into high positions. So then I started to look at my experience. And here's a case study. I remember when I just had some of when I was 19 and I got a job um, in a bank, in a really top high market bank. And um, I was young. And I was sassy and I really wanted to, you know, really climb up the, the ladder. And I, what, I was blocked, you know. What happened was that some of the women that were there, they didn't like me. I didn't understand why. Every time I, I wanted to share my, um, in terms of when we're talking about products in the bank, they did, it's like they put me to the, the back. They made me do like really easy tasks. And I'm like, I think if I'm, a, I'm good at analyzing, I'm good at, you know, 
talking, pitching, and they did not allow me to. So I was constantly block, block, block. And then what happened, I realized that um, when, I, when, I, when I wanted to talk to the other black women who were there, I realized that they were at a lower, they were at the lower end of the um, job market and they didn't have a voice, they didn't have a say. So it was difficult for me to even liaise or to talk about my aspirations. So I left and um, as a result of me leaving, what I did, I took the, the bank to, um, I took them to the tribunal and I won. So at 20 years old, just having my daughter, I won this case with so much money. I didn't understand it at the time. And from that experience, what, what it did for me was look at understanding when you're in a workforce or in a workplace, it's about understanding emotional intelligence. Everybody in your workplace are different, yeah? And one of the things that I've recently read was um, essential in terms of the, I don't know if you heard of the article, putting the I before the D to bolster potential um, inclusion. And I'm all about inclusion. I think inclusion is important because having different, it's key because having different people on your team, you value their differences. And for me, you know, working with women from different cultures, my understanding is get them involved. They are able to make your, your organization do exceptionally well. A recent um, documentary by um, a report by Mackenzie, recent report is called entitled Diversity Wins and How Inclusion Matter. And they did another report in 2015 and they talked about... Oh, I think we just, we just, oh, okay. There's a lot happening here. Paulette just got cut off for a little bit, but we're going to get back to you. There was lots of juice there. You just gave us so much, Paulette. And I just want to just first say thank you for sharing your story and just for like jumping right into your personal experience and how you came to understand like what is intersectionality. I, I really love and adore the fact that you immediately brought in to this space, a virtual space, if you will, um, the critical race theorist, Kimberly Crenshaw, who was credited, you know, for coining the term intersectionality, which is just for to break it down for those who are watching who might not have like the fullest of understanding or maybe you just you haven't read up on it yet it's it's on your to-do list yeah. the idea that there are oppressions in the world so paulette very clearly spoke to racism and, and she spoke to sexism and then you know we have other isms we have anti-semitism islamophobia etc cetera, etc cetera. but the idea is that when someone is dealing with multiple oppressions, when they're dealing with one oppression and another oppression, when they intersect, that experience at that intersection of navigating multiple oppressions creates a very different, unique, compounded, and particularistic experience. Yeah. So the experience of a white woman, she is absolutely dealing with sexism. Yeah. But if the woman is also black, that black woman at that intersection yeah. creates a different experience. If we were to layer that with disabilism, that's another different experience. If we were to layer that with Islamophobia, so this idea of intersectionality, if we, if we analyze them at silos, we mm -hmm. miss the experiences of individuals and how they are compounded and how they are particularistic. So I just want to thank you, Paulette, for bringing that into the space. And you started speaking about how you were doing research and, you know, you were generating reports and reading reports and seeing that, you know, there are some people who are having very different experiences in the workforce than others. And I thought, oh, my God, Rafi was like, this is what I study. So Rafi, I would love for you to tell us, like, when did you come to understand the term intersectionality? But I would also really love to, you know, hear you layer your background with, you know, the research that you've taken part with, with, you know, Paulette's story and just give us more yeah. truth and nuggets. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I guess to the first part of that, of my coming to understand what this actually is, I think it's really, it's really weird, I think, for a lot of people who live an intersectional life that's more apparent. I think everybody's intersectional in some ways, but I think um, for those of us for whom are parts of like multiple marginalized groups, mm. um, then you know it, you know the experience before you know the word. Ah, I um, love that. Mm -hmm. So like when I was growing up, so my, I, I grew up in, I mentioned Edmonton, Alberta, which is a 
uh, a pretty conservative part of Canada. It's the certainly the most conservative part of Canada uh, by in terms of how it votes, mm -hmm. um, and in many ways that that was reflected in the people that I was living around. Um, and I was, you know, I'm a brown-skinned person. My family is originally Indian ethnically, a number of generations ago. Um, but I was one of only two brown kids in my school of 650 people. Um, and my family is Muslim as well, which played a role in my life because I was 12 years old when September 11th happened. Um, and it was my first week of middle school. But then um, when I was 13 or 14, I was starting to realize that my sexual orientation may not be uh, what I would have expected. Um, so I now identify as bisexual and I, you know, I didn't really know how to handle that back then. But I think what it was, was kind of realizing that I didn't really feel like I fit in a lot with my uh, school community as much anymore. Just having that experience of racial discrimination for the first time after September 11th, or really noticing it that way. Um, and being a Muslim person in a predominantly Christian area, but then also not really feeling totally at home in my Muslim community that was somewhat conservative and definitely expressed a lot of homophobia growing up. And so um, I think part of the intersectional experience is can sometimes be feeling this tug between two different worlds that you want to feel not really feeling a part of either and, that, and this kind of intense loneliness that can occur as a result. I didn't hear the term intersectionality till I was in college, but I feel like it was one of those things where you hear the term and all of a sudden something clicks in your brain and you're like, oh yeah, that's what that is. Yeah. Um, and it was one of those things where I heard the word in a class and just like immediately I was like, yep, I, I know that. Mm -hmm. um, there's a line that I love that I feel like really describes it was, um, language is the Trojan horse through which the universe enters the mind. And it's like, you know, you hear a word and you, and all of a sudden you start noticing it everywhere. Um, and it ended up, I ended up kind of reflecting on that a lot more. And it came out in the research that I was doing both as a student and afterwards. And when I was in my research fellowship, um, particularly when we were looking at the experiences of white versus black women versus white and black men in interview situations. Mm -hmm. So what we did these experiments where we would look at um, how do people respond to a video of someone negotiating for higher pay with an HR rep? And the only thing you change, if the script is exactly the same, the only thing you change is whether the person who's arguing for this, doing the negotiation is black, white, man or woman. So this was done in the US um, and we found like a number of things, but what we found that was really, really fascinating to me um, was uh, for black women in particular, there was massive deviation in responses based on hairstyle. And I thought that was another interesting thing that we ended, that other researchers have really gone depth, in depth into is how how white do you portray yourself effectively? So if you change your natural hair to look straighter, then people would respond to you differently than if you had natural curls or an afro. Um, and then we'd see things like the same behavior and same script would elicit a reaction for men exhibiting this behavior as like standing up for themselves and knowing their value. Whereas for women, they were always, and I mean literally always, every time in 150 trials, described as abrasive and no one wanted to work with them, even if they said that they were effective at their job. And so you can really see the effects of those different layers of, of race and gender in particular when, with the research that I was doing and how that can completely change the way people respond to you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, you just gave so many good nuggets there. This notion of like, it is very compounded, it is layered, it's particularistic. And even within that, there are some differences mm -hmm. by how one presents themselves physically that can you know, change the ways in which you are perceived in the world. 
This next question, I would love to hear from Elham, especially, you know, knowing the organizations that you started. By the way, I'm just impressed that you remembered all of those numbers for every different department. I I would have had to have a sheet right here to remember exactly those numbers. So your memory is impeccable. But thinking about intersectionality, like it's about applying these different analysis to the same phenomena to surface new dynamics. So you were speaking to, you know, in that particular space, in these boardrooms, et cetera, you noticed there was some very clear trends here. There were some people that were, that were missing from the table or just missing from the conversation in totality. I would love to hear since you started your, your company, your organization, like how have you lived this spirit of, of intersectionality, like this lens in which to approach things? How have you lived this spirit? What has the outcome been? You know, what are what are you doing? Can you just talk to us about that since you've been you've started something from the from the ground up? Thank you, Sable. Um, I think I can very much relate to what everyone has said so far mm -hmm. in terms of the concept of intersectionality. And I would say that. I've experienced intersectionality throughout my life and my career because very early on I was aware that I belong to multiple groups mm -hmm. um, and that um, really that I didn't know it's called intersectionality mm -hmm. but I recognized that early in my career people try to put you in certain boxes based mm -hmm. on what they can see and what is visible to them. I became very aware that actually um, intersectionality as a concept seems to attempt to um, model um, people and model life. But much like quantitative modeling, it's not perfect. Mm. That reality and humans are a lot more complex and unique than that. So I didn't know early on, maybe 20 years ago, I didn't know this is called intersectionality, but I really felt it. I really felt determined that actually, like everyone else, I'm unique. And I didn't like people telling me what is my identity or what it should be and how I should feel and which groups I belong to. Because I, like everyone else, am unique and individual. Um, we talk about intersectionality in the boardrooms and actually the way I look at it, there is a pyramid in the UK boardrooms. Even when you look at individual diversity strands, they are missing in the UK boards. If you look at the Alexander Hampton report, mm -hmm. if you look at the Parker review, if you look at LGBT numbers, which actually aren't, as reported on as they could be. Mm -hmm. We don't talk about these things. So many of the diversity strands on their own are missing in the boardrooms. And if you bring intersectionality into it, I, I think you will notice that even more is missing from the boards. Mm -hmm. That is not to say we can't do anything about it. It just says that there is some low hanging fruit there's some root causes and that we need to collaborate and work with each other, not just with those who resemble us, but with those who are from all strands of diversity, even some strands that we may not consider as diverse. For instance, white British males, um, middle-aged men from disadvantaged backgrounds who really we can relate to and un we, we together understand what is disadvantage and to support, mentor, sponsor and help each other progress actually. Mm -hmm. And so my experience has been very much um, an individual experience of living and breathing diversity throughout my career. Thank you for that. I would love to hear from you, um, Candice, on this notion of like when you think about the organizations that you've worked for, you know, in the past or even organizations you might want to engage with in some capacity in the future, how do you wish that organizations would approach, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion through an intersectional lens differently? Yeah, I, I think the most difficult thing is our uh, workplace environment, the companies and um, 
you know, like organizations, associations. So any place of work is still very much, they want to talk and they want to touch and the diversity inclusivity, but mm -hmm. they don't really want to do something about mm -hmm. it, you know? So they really don't want to take the action. Mm -hmm. So you want to talk because you wanted to show to the world that you care, but in reality, they just find excuses or put obstacles on the let's do something, really. So I think to the very start, that comes from a place of scare, you know, of changes, because I think most of the human beings, we are very much comfortable on our on our comfortable zone so when you have to shake it up and you have to make changes people they don't know how to react and um, because you know it's, it's normal I think it's a very something that's normal for the human nature uh, when I was working corporate and I was in positions of leadership um, in the just for as an example in my home in my house, I don't you know, I have a son that now he's 26 years old. Mm -hmm. I always say and talk about people. I try not, I'm talking this for 25 years because I come from, my background is art. So I was a ballerina and in this industry, we have the LGBT very strong. So. I grew up in a place and uh, around people that were very much about, I love you the way you are, and I respect you for who you are. So when I was in corporate, that I left the arts and went to corporate in sales and technology, I had to fit in. So that is the first time that I have, so like Hafi said, I knew the feeling I knew the experience. I didn't know the world for that, you know? So I was in a place that being a woman was like, oh, you're not belong. Mm -hmm. uh, to belong, you have to be very, um, like having male attitudes and characteristics in, you know, like in sales. And I was lucky because I was, I'm very competitive. So what in the ballet and when I work in a more feminine industry, I was always bullied because I was too straight to the point. I was too honest. I was too, you know, whatever the words that they want to say. So I never really fit in anywhere. And until the day that I said, I have to be myself, I have to respect myself. And then I started looking for that. So every time that I have company, I have worked for companies and nowadays working as a contractor or stepping in as a consultant, I, the first thing that I saw, I, I tried to figure out is the culture that the mm -hmm. company has, you know, not about benefits or about, oh, we have Friday, happy hour or oh we have apples and bananas every single day for the breakfast i don't care i buy apples and bananas you know i want to know about your your people culture how are you respecting people how people can have their voice li literally heard and what kind of changes you're doing and the showing people that you really care because until you act it's nothing you know for me you know, sometimes I'm really rush, like very, because it, it is me, it's my personality, I'm born that way. Uh, so for me, just words are, are really good because the debate and the conversation has to start it. But until you make, take actions mm -hmm. and really change the environment, even at home, uh, it's nothing, you know. So I think companies, they are talking too much and uh, a little bit scared of taking actions. Thank you for sharing that. I would love to hear from anyone, honestly, like why do you think that intersectionality is such a buzzword right now? Like, I, 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 go ahead, Paulette, yeah. I, I think personally, this is my experience, I think it has to be a buzzword, especially with the uh, new and emerging technology. And, um, as you know that, you know, white male take up a like 23% in artificial, um, artificial intelligent jobs. 
and they are the one who write the code. So when you think about um, the facial recognition tools and how um, the algorithm behind it looks at recognized white male face and fail to recognize black woman face, yeah? So there's that unconscious bias right there. And we, black women or women need to understand because of this unconscious bias and the algorithm used to try and exclude us, we need to understand what what intersectionality mean, what does it mean for us and how we can get involved, meaning get more involved in jobs like STEM, you know, try and be the ladies behind the one to create the algorithm so we can change the status quo. So that's why I feel it's a buzzword. It's about us taking up those seats, getting involved in tech, being able to probably become programmers, write the algorithm so that we're not excluded anymore. That's why intersectionality has to be a buzzword. Our young people, black women, women in, on a whole need to understand what it includes. Murphy, I you know, thought we, you were gonna say something. Yeah, I was just gonna kind of amplify what Paulette's saying a little bit and add to it by just saying that, um, I think in addition to it being needed, I think part of the reason it needs it's so, it's so needed by companies right now mm -hmm. is that people who are who are marginalized in multiple ways and so live these kind of marginalized intersectionalities, mm -hmm. um, they have a voice like they've never really had before, um, in part because of things like social media. But I think in general, um, you know, I feel like it's, it's allowed those groups of people who might be in the minority in one company or in a really strong minority in one company to see each other, hear about the fact that their experiences are not theirs alone and band together to form these kind of more broader understandings of the systemic oppression that they are feeling that they may not have necessarily known beforehand or at least known in that kind of capacity. Mm -hmm. And so I think companies are now realizing that they are missing those voices. I think at some point, you know, when you when Paulette was talking about the, the fact that so many coders are just middle-aged white men and as a result, their facial recognition software ends up being imbued with the biases that they themselves hold. Mm -hmm. I think it's just a result of them not realizing that they're missing a lot of black women. Yeah. So like one example that I'll share that I was, I was on a webinar um, a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. and, so, and we were talking on Zoom and we talked about the idea of people using virtual backgrounds as a way to kind of equalize the playing field between people who might not have as much money or might be embarrassed about their living situation when speaking with their boss's boss who might, you know, have a much nicer home. And someone related the idea, something that I actually just didn't know, was that um, the Zoom virtual backgrounds are really bad at dealing with curly hair. And oh, so, it's atrocious. I can speak right. myself. <laughs> and what was really interesting is that the moderator of that discussion is a black man. And he was like, oh, no, it's totally fine. You know, like, I have curly hair. And he was like, well, you have curly, very short cropped hair. Mm -hmm. And it's a very different experience. And I think, like, even when people are trying to be like, yeah, we're going to make sure black people are interfacing with our code of how we do these virtual backgrounds, if you're not including black women, you're excluding black women. Yeah. And, and also women started. of color who have curly hair. Like there's a whole bunch yeah. of women of color with curly with curly hair. I love I love this conversation. And we've already started you touching on this idea of like voices and voices. Like who voices are heard, who voices yeah. aren't heard. Um Candace, Elham, mm -hmm. Rafi, even Paula, you've all spoken to this notion of like belonging. Like who has the privilege of belonging no matter where they go? What it, no matter what space they're in and who, depending on, you know, where they are, they're, you might not necessarily have that, that feeling of belonging. But I want to talk to this idea about voices and the amplification of voices. Like, how have we seen organizations you work in, in the past, currently, organizations you work with, um, how have you seen them amplify voices that aren't the norm, that don't fit the default, that would not neatly pack into the status quo that Paulette has highlighted. You see, if, if I may say, um, yeah. Sable, um, humans have evolved to survive mm -hmm. and therefore humans have evolved to sense what is the reality of something. And the sense of belonging the sense of inclusion, 
simply to have hope of promotion, progression, board appointments. All of this depends on every one of us seeing role models in the senior leadership and the boardroom that in visible and non-visible ways resemble us. Mm. We need to see women who might uh, have the strengths that might be associated traditionally with males. We want to see others uh, who resemble us. We want to see that it's possible, no matter what we look like or where we come from or what our orientation is, no matter what our strengths are and characteristics are, that we have a chance of succeeding in the corporates. So all of this, to me, uh, one of the key ways of resolving this corporate diversity and sense of belonging and inclusion is through the generation of the talent pipeline. For me, it's all about diverse talent, and that is consistently uh, the reason why I drive uh, this development of diverse talent in everything that I do for migrant leaders as a charity, as well as developing diverse talent and championing diverse talent in ID inclusion for our corporate clients. Because if you have a pipeline of diverse talent coming through the ranks, then many of these challenges, not all, but many of these challenges will be resolved. Thank you for that. So one way of amplifying stories and voices of those that wouldn't fall into the default or the status quo is diversifying the talent pipeline to begin with. Because if you just take that at face value, the understanding might be, well, if the pipeline is diverse to begin with, when it's time to promote, since many promotions do happen internally, that diversity is already present within the organization. So that, that's definitely one, one way of amplifying voices and stories. Um, I would love to hear like, what other examples have we seen of organizations saying, I'm going to amplify the voices of those that are typically not heard or seen? Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I so I'll come at this from like the data side because that's my that's my comfort zone. Go um, for it. Data but um, one of the so one of the things that we've done in our organization um, is we do this thing that I developed this tool called the inclusion di that we call it inclusion diagnostic. But basically, it's a way of trying to quantitatively measure how included people feel in an organization. And so with one uh, financial organization based in the UK, we uh, we ran this tool uh, across the firm. We got a few, we got about 60% response rate. So it was pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, pretty good for a long and complicated survey. Um, but that ended up being, you know, a few thousand responses. Um, and one of the things that we always like to try and highlight is, you know, we always try to disaggregate by demographic data, which I think should be a standard and is a standard in some places, but a lot of companies are still lagging behind on that front. Mm -hmm. um, but what we also do is try to see, is try to cut by intersectional groups of people as well. And one of the things that we found with this particular firm was that uh, the scores across all the different aspects of inclusion that we measured, so things like uh, feelings of transparency and objectivity in personnel decisions, uh, psychological safety uh, mm -hmm. with their teams, um, experiences of microaggression. So, you know, like how often are you interrupted in meetings? Mm -hmm. How often are your ideas attributed to other people? Things like that. Mm -hmm. We saw that the scores for white men mm -hmm. were, you know, not perfect by any means, but they were about like a 3.7 out of 5 kind of thing. But for black women, it was like a 1.2. And there is no zero score. Like one was is the lowest. Mm -hmm. And so, but the thing is that there were so few white women in the organization in general that people just kind of tended to dismiss that data or those anecdotes that they would hear. Mm -hmm. um, and what and and what we also found out is that they had like an employee resource group for ethnic minority <laughs> broadly, but black women who were in this were in this group saying like, hey, our experience is distinctly different from the Asian women or the Asian men or the black men even, you know, they, they weren't being really taken into account very much. Their vo their stories just, they would be brushed off as anecdata, not actual data. 
Um, so when we were able to show this to, you know, the, the executive board of this company and be like, Hey, this is data. This is a graph. They, and then we would amplify that with the stories that we had already heard that people had been saying for years and years and years, they would be able to really feel that a lot more strongly. But I think what's really, what's more impact or maybe not more impactful, but also impactful is we've done this with other organizations that literally just don't have enough black women to run that analysis. Like they only have in a company of 2000 people that we did this with, they only had four black women in the whole company. And so if that's the case, you know, you just can't run that analysis without, well, like ac with accurately yeah. noticing those differences. Um, but also it's too easy to identify who those people are. So it's not responsible to do it either. But what we would then talk about then is rather than saying, you know, oh, we didn't find anything here. It, we would very specifically say, you don't even have enough black women in your company to do the analysis that we would normally do. So your company is doing that poorly on this area. And that in itself might be a way, even if your company, if you're saying like our company isn't diverse enough to amplify those voices via data, that's that in itself is a story that needs to be told. I was going to thank you for that. I was going to ask like how could we use intersectionality when analyzing data? But yeah. I mean, Rossi, by all means. <laughs> <laughs> You just highlighted that. And this notion, I, I love this. It's like there's two sides of it. There's, and I believe that humans in general have to do better with holding two truths or multiple truths at the yeah. same time. Like, yes, data is a tool. Um, it's a tool that many organizations use, small or large, global even. I guess you can call that extra large for sake of conversation. Like, data is a tool. When we have the data, when there are enough people to get the data, whatever, you know, however we disaggregate mm -hmm. it or whatever we're trying to figure out, like what do we then do with that data? Candidates, we spoke to action. It's like, okay, we now know this thing. What do we then do? Yeah. And then I love this other side. Well, if there happens to be an organization where we can't ethically run this tool because it'd be very, very clear who responded and who says and thinks what, we can't just give. Um, anonymous antidote, if you yeah. will. Well, there's something we can also do with that, the idea, well, there's not even enough people here in this particular um, social identity group, whatever that group might be to run this data, that still leads us to a conversation. Well, then what mm -hmm. do we have to then do? What action can we take to also- But, but that's, that's, that's where, where Sable, um, yeah. Sable, that's where a toolbox is useful in life. Because in any problem, if you try and use only the same tool, whether it's quantitative analysis, it will be limited. Exactly. So um, Rafi brought an excellent example of where um, there were only a few data points and therefore the data was skewed. Um, the the da data and people entering their intersections and diversity strands, the data might not be correct. All sorts of limitations to quantitative analysis. But that's where quantitative analysis of any kind can only be one tool in the box. Um, if, for example, for example, in the case of the example that Rafi discussed was a really potent example. There can be qualitative analysis in such cases. Why would a company then stop? Why wouldn't they get the three or four Afro-Caribbean women together in a focus group and use quant qualitative analysis and focus groups to understand a little bit more about their experience and challenges and root causes and how, therefore, the company uh, culture maturity curve in terms of inclusion maturity curve, mm -hmm. something that I uh, always uh, uh, use, I, I, I kind of came up with that terminology of inclusion maturity curve in terms of the mm -hmm. culture. Mm -hmm. um, and and therefore, how can we address the root causes of these challenges? There are all sorts of tools in the box that any company can use if they um, are willing to um, open their minds to it, Thank which, you. Which, which many are open and mm -hmm. able to do that. Thank you for amplifying that. Like, you know, this notion of if we have this tool, we have used this data, what can we then do if we do not have the ability to run this particular tool? Still, now, you know, having that as center of the conversation, what can we then do? And very much so highlighted a possibility. Now, I'll be very open and frank to say, 
members of people who are dealing with various systems of oppression and existing with various inequities, they might not be very comfortable with a, a qualitative data experience, particularly if it's such a small number. So there's risk to be had in that. Mm -hmm. However, it doesn't mean that that's not an option that can be explored. So just this idea of whether there is data or not, what can an organization then do? What can they then action from that? So I absolutely adore this particular conversation. Going back to the buzzword of it all with intersectionality, when I think about buzzwords, when I think about jargon in general, we live, I'm over here in the United States where the news cycle is no longer 24 hours, it's about eight. Um, I've done no research on that, just so you know, just pure observation and picking numbers here. But, you know, there are there are definitely instances where something occurs, there's a new jargon, there's a new hot topic. It gets all this energy, it gets all this zhuzh, and then it kind of just like dissipates. It's not that no one's talking about it again, you know, anymore. It's just, it doesn't have the platform that it once had for those three months, for those three years. And it's not that folks that are living with multiple oppressions have just disappeared off of the face of the planet. They're very much still here. It's just, it might no longer be the the hot topic in that space. So with with that in mind, I would love to hear from one or two two of you. If you had to, like if this was your your PR spin, your 30 second elevator pitch, and there was someone in the audience who we really had to do our best to express to them the importance of keeping this top of mind even if you know various societies are no longer considering it a hot topic, what would you say to them? So five years from now, six years from now, six months from now, they're like, oh, okay. Not only is this a term that was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, but this is what this means and this is what this allows you to do in efforts of actually building inclusive organizations and societies and cultures. So if I can say, um, I always say to corporate leaders, and I think they know this intuitively, that diversity can make them money because of two major reasons. Number one, that if you have a wider pool of talent, mm -hmm. by definition, you're going to put the best people in the right jobs and therefore they will perform better and do better for the company, make more money for you. But also, even more importantly, when it comes to the increasingly challenging and complex, globalized, unpredictable world of business, as particularly now we know, when it comes to problem solving and being agile and responding to changes in the business environment, that's where diversity brings real strengths to companies at every level. So diversity absolutely has a business case. And I would always encourage corporate leaders to remember that and let that drive them, as well as doing the right thing in corporate social responsibility. They should also know that diversity has a definite business case. If they remember that, they will always be driven to have in their in their mind all these important issues. Personally, I think, um, thanks, I think to years from now, I think always for organizations to always understand that they must always, in order to break the glass ceiling, they must always acknowledge that it's their first. Mm -hmm. And for employers or leaders to always hold them, hold the leaders to account. So for example, if they're going to look at including um, individuals, understanding their differences, but making sure that if we want, if we are looking at promotion, we're looking at training opportunities. If we haven't met the quarter or the, you know, the, the, the hold leaders to account, why hasn't why haven't we achieved that agenda? So th that's what I would say moving mm -hmm. forward, definitely. Uh, yeah, if I may, I would mm -hmm. also like to add my my opinion here, because I work with uh, uh, you know in in the magazine as an advocate or in my business, I always work with leaders and uh, in technology most of them are men, and mm -hmm. I always 
is mentioned, you're going to make more business. So going back to Elhan says, your return of investment is always going to be better if you have a more diverse. And the second point is the reputation of your company, not only to your audience, the people, the companies or people, if you're B2B or B2C. So the audience that buy from you, but also to attract and retain the new talent because and we know, especially in technology, companies have been changing culture really, really quickly. And now, because of the millennials and how quick millennials are changing companies, so they are they can't see the that they have been respected. Sometimes they do not understand or they do not agree with the culture, so they just find another place. So I think for me and as a business person. And, and working with leaders is the is what they want to hear. You know, it's you're gonna make more money and you attract a reputation, part for recruitment, part for selling even more. So I think it's this is the kind of things that they will understand. They usually they understand. Rafi, you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of, I, I think we're actually in a really really good moment. Mm -hmm. uh, it, to keep intersectionality on people's minds mm -hmm. because right now people are starting to prepare to go back to their physical offices um, all over again. And I think those people who are employees are, are realizing just how much flexibility they could theoretically have with their jobs that might have been previously denied to them. And managers are realizing just how much leeway they can give to different people and how different people's needs uh, can differ from each other. And I think for really, this is a such an amazing opportunity to treat people as individuals rather than as groups. Um, and that's one of the biggest issues I have with how people tend to use data. I'd like to try something new. Um, Those of you who are able... I don't know where that's coming from. I'm sorry. It, we're in a virtual land, it happens. Even oh, if we were we live, things I think happen. I accidentally hit the space bar and it uh, played <laughs> oh, my okay. Kimberly Crenshaw TED Talk that I have up on my other screen. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the issues I have with the way a lot of people rely so heavily on data mm -hmm. is that they use that to drive how they treat anybody who might be part of that group. Mm. The problem is that individuals are not average. If you take the average of people, then everybody has one breast and one testicle. Like that's a famous like quote from statisticians. And yeah. it's just that like, that's not how people are. Individuals are individuals and they may or may not conform with any particular stereotype, even if that stereotype is well-founded. So I think we're in a really interesting point where people can start demanding more of their managers and managers can start being much more individual in the way that they manage people. And so I think this is like a really great opportunity, particularly as people come back to work, mm -hmm. to really help treat people like individual people and give them the support that they need rather than giving the support you think they need. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And and just staying on that that grain, what advice would you give to organizations, no matter their size, who want to live the values of inclusion and intersectionality? in this current time of COVID-19, knowing folks will slowly be making their way back to the office. Like, what advice would you give those organizations? If I had to say one thing is train your line managers and operational managers, because inclusion and in an inclusive culture mm -hmm. actually is at its best mm -hmm. across the operations, not just at the top. Mm. The key decisions, um, hiring decisions, promotion decisions, resourcing decisions, um, project decisions, uh, behaviors, um, all of those things happen typically at the operational level. So certainly train your line managers in inclusive leadership mm -hmm. and get them to live and breathe those values every day until it's part of their DNA. Yes, this so training the managers, I'm just echoing what you shared, yeah. training the managers, because it is true at the organization, those line managers play a 
with interpersonal relations, but also with following the various structures, policies, and processes that are in place. They, they play a very integral part, but not only that, to make sure it's, be, it's embedded into the ecosystem of the DNA mm -hmm. of the organization. That, that is, I love that. Any other thoughts about like, okay, before we knew it, we were in a pandemic. The world was responding in very different ways. People were working from home. We have our essential workers, like whatever the organization is and wherever folks are working or able to work based on the positions that they hold. What other tips of advice and nuggets of information would you share to organizations that are, they're like, I want to keep this top of mind, but I'm not exactly sure how given the terrain that we're currently in? I think, you know, just to, to basically add on to what you said, Elham, you know, I can also incorporate in a social listening ear. Listen to your, your, your employees, listen to your leadership team, um, make inclusion your priority. Um, also adopt a, a systematic approach, a business-led approach, making sure that you focus on each individual one, but also create a lasting, long transformational culture that recognize the different needs of your clients or employees. Thank you for that. I think that was, that was such a beautiful place to begin to tie us in together. When you have an organization that has hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of employees, and they're all very individual, I mean, you would be a hamster on a wheel if you try to solve for each individual person. But if we embed into the DNA and the ecosystem of the organization systemic changes that build in equity and inclusion, then you're already ahead of you're ahead of the game. And I just I just really appreciate that. This has been such a rich conversation. It was a pleasure hearing from all of you with your different backgrounds. I mean, I think we had the same amount of tech glitches that we would have had if we were on a stage together. I've been on my chair of stages and you're talking into the microphone and no one can hear you. It's <laughs> on microphone sound check. So, you know, we just are where we are in the world. So I appreciate everyone who's watching the flexibility, the flexibility of all of you here. But it, I would be remiss to finish up without everyone sharing. How can we connect with you after this? How can we stay in touch? Because if if ever there were a time in our present day for those who you know are living to reconnect or to connect with those who are doing the type of work that has the advice and insights that we need and that skill, those analytical frameworks to be able to help build equity into the ecosystem of an organization, I would say wholeheartedly the time would be now. So Paulette, can you let us know how to stay in contact with you? We have two minutes, so we got to do a little okay. bit. Okay, so follow us by Instagram at Academy Achievers Limited or Twitter, Facebook. We are going to be launching our Be Me project on the 24th of June where we want to raise 1 million Be Me girls aspiration in science, technology, engineering and mass careers. We are going to be creating an AI gaming product that will help to encourage and engage these girls. We're looking for advisors, game developers, graphic designers, experts in AI, machine and deep learning, virtual reality, augmented reality too. Thank you. It's been an awesome opportunity Thank being here. Thank you. Candice, so you don't leave us again, go now. <laughs> Yes. So to find me, the best place is definitely LinkedIn. So if you look at to Candice with Y, Costa, and you just, you know, send me uh, like a request to connect and just please add that you are like, you watch us here because usually I do not accept uh, connections if I don't know who you are. So yeah, LinkedIn is the best place. Thank you. We have less than a minute. So Elham Rafi, go. Elham first. Sure. Yeah. sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so certainly you can contact me on LinkedIn. My name is pretty unique, Elham Fardot. But if there is one thing you do is go to our website, idinclusion.com. That's idinclusion.com. And register to use our free diversity accelerator modules. Um, a brainchild of mine was the diverse talent journey model 
that uh, I developed and from that have emerged 12 diversity accelerators that we are giving away to the market to help diverse talents succeed in the corporates. So go to idinclusion.com. Thank you. Rafi? Awesome. Yeah, you can uh, see my name uh, on the Women in Tech website and you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok, all the things. Um, yeah, find me anywhere. Um, and uh, yeah, you can reach out about our company at www.frostincluded.com and you can find more about the different tools that we have to offer. And I'll just wrap us up. I am Sable Lomax. U.S. Director of Programs for Fearless Futures. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Fearless Futures or fearlessfutures.org. It was super exciting having this chat. Thank you all for sharing your thoughts, your experiences, your personal background, where you are, how you got there, your thoughts on how you came to understand intersectionality and really digging into what does it really mean and also sharing what could organizations do now to keep it front of mind so it's a buzzword that never loses its actual speed. So it's been a pleasure. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your day. Make sure you hydrate, take care of yourselves. I know shutdowns are still happening, but please, please, please get some fresh air and just keep intersectionality top of mind. And when you get a chance, I would largely encourage you to check out the critical race theorist, Kimberly Crenshaw, and she spells Kimberly with an E at the end not with a Y. So our Candace is with a Y. Our Kimberly is with an E. Wonderful. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.